So welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So we have completed a session, yeah, two sessions on defining different interest rates. Everything was based on the zero copper bond, yeah, a very atomic object. Yeah. Also very, maybe very nice to store information in the computer. It just has the single parameter, capital T, the time when we receive back the um, amount of one unit. But a zero copper bond is not traded on the market. Uh, the popular products are coupon bonds yeah, or swaps. So we define now the interest rate products. And actually in the end, there is some kind of inverse problem. We observe financial products, which rely on the quantities we have introduced, interest rates, zero cover bonds, but we observe these products and we could ask, okay, how do I determine these nice atomic input quantities? How do I determine the zero cover bond curve? So I start with products without optionality. Uh, I also could call this linear products. Well, in the end, you could say these are the products that pay a linear function of the forward rate, but that's not already enough at the right time. So this pay, and we will have a first understanding of this, also depends on the time when we pay it. And if we have this property that we have a linear product, you already had this nice idea when we looked at the backward rate, then this is related to the ability of performing static replication. This means that all this stuff can be valued actually without a stochastic model. It's a linear product. Everything is then coming down to observe expectations. We will later then turn to more complicated products that have a nonlinear payout, so our options. And there we need um, a stochastic model also some model parameters to determine the value. So we have defined a single interest rate product, the zero coupon bond. Well, we also defined our accrual account, our reinvestment strategy. But that was also based on the zero coupon bond. And now I define some more general interest rate products. The first thing is a very trivial generalization of the zero coupon bond. It is the coupon bond. Okay, so the coupon bond has some coupons. So these are just constants. So the CI, I can think of it as being in R if you like, okay. So no random variable, it's constant. And I have some tenor structure. So I have our little time discretization, TI. And then I pay the coupon times the period length. So I pay CI times delta TI, which is TI plus one minus TI. And you know, behind this is now some convention, some day count convention. I pay this at the end of the period. So I pay it in TI plus one. This is done for all I. Yeah? I've now from one to N minus one. Okay, so the last payment time is here my TN. So I have N minus one payments. And in the last time point in the TN, I also pay one unit of currency. Yeah? So if the I plus one is equal to N, so I runs to N minus one, then I also pay the one unit back. 
So you see, this is a zero copper bond here paying one unit, but it also pays a regular coupon here. And also at the last point, I pay this coupon. So on this time discretization. Oh wait, there's a small typo, right? period starts in T1, but in T1, there is no payment. Okay, so this guy should go away. So this is our first period. At the end of the period, I pay the coupon C1 times T2 minus T1, yeah? paid in T2. So what's the value of a coupon bond? Okay, that's trivial because we have the assumption that a scaled financial product has just the scaled value of the original financial product. So if I pay now this one unit here, this blue guy in the last point, the value of this is just a zero copper bond. But for example, this guy here is just C1 times Delta T1 times the value of a zero copper bond. So instead of inter interpreting this as one financial product, I can just interpret it as a portfolio of different financial products, namely here one, two, three, four zero copper bonds with different notionals. So the value of the coupon bond is just a sum of values of zero copper bonds scaled with different scaling factors. So I have the zero copper bond that pays in TN. This is here my final amount one. And I have the zero copper bond for every coupon. So for every coupon, I have CI times delta TI times the zero copper bond. So the value of my coupon bond is this evaluated in time little t and the little t should just be before the first payment of the coupon huh? because otherwise, yeah, maybe we have to discuss what happens then with the payment that was in the past. Okay, so I can value this for little t smaller or equal t2. Um, yeah, the result follows from the assumption that the value of a linear combination of financial products corresponds to the linear combination of the individual values. Maybe I should have stated this as a small axiom. No? Okay, this is behind all this here. No? Buying two financial products has the sum of the values of buying the individual products. So this means if I have an amount M paid in TI plus one, then this corresponds to be buying M units of a zero copper bond that pays in TI plus one. And if I say now buying M units, so I have to be a little bit careful. Yeah? I mean, this is maybe a little bit over precise here, but if M is a Euro amount in a certain currency, yeah? so if I say I pay you M in TI plus one, uh, I pay you that amount of Euros, then it means that I do not buy five euros of units of the zero copper bond because the zero copper bond already has the unit euros. So I buy M divided by one currency unit, units of this zero copper bond. Okay, so if you come from physics, yeah, you can just check that now the units of these quantities are correct. Yeah, so the unit of the P here is one currency and the unit of the M is also one currency. And of course, M times P, well, I do not like to have one currency squared. Yeah, So I have to divide here with this one unit of currency. 
this little thing with the currencies is not necessary here yeah, because we just have a single currency and it is somewhat implicit if a quantity is unitless or if a quantity represents a payment, then it is in some currency. But um, so here stating the currency unit is maybe not relevant, but later it is relevant. So if you have a model that models two different markets and two different currencies, then there are strange effects, the quantum adjustment, uh, if, you, if you mix up the currencies and it's important to distinguish this. For that reason, I sometimes try to be precise and uh, carry this. Yeah? So this here is the value of the zero core bond because these guys here already carry the currency unit. And this here is the payment. And in the payment, I pay you the coupon, which is a, this guy is a percentage divided by time. It is per time. The coupon multiplied with time multiplied with currency. Okay, so this is a very simple product. It is just the payment multiplied with the zero coupon bond. What I have written down is the so-called dirty price. So what you have in equation 71 is the so-called dirty price. It is the one that for us as a mathematician is the true value. But if you look up prices on the market, uh, you will sometimes also see different prices. You will see the so-called clean price. So there's the so-called clean price. And what's that? Okay, the two differ by um, a quantity called accrued interest and the accrued interest. So if I am here in a period, yeah, my observation time little t is inside a period t1 to t2. Then I define the accrued interest as the fractional amount of the coupon. So you see if this T here is equal to T2, then this here is equal to one, then it is actually the whole payment. Yeah. So in the end, it is the whole payment, but at an earlier time, it is just a fraction of this payment. So you make a linear scaling of the coupon that you receive in the end, and you subtract this crude interest from our dirty price. Huh? So the dirty price is the one actually that we are interested in when we perform valuation, but the so-called clean price is the one that you sometimes find in the newspapers or on some web pages. Why, why are you doing this? So if you subtract this fraction, one minus this here multiplied with the coupon. So for T2, the coupon is fully removed. Yeah? Uh, for little t equals T2, the coupon is fully removed from the clean price. If you are in the beginning of the period, it is still the whole amount of the coupon. So it means that the holder of the bond just owns a fraction of the coupon that corresponds to the time period that is left. Yeah? So this is a little bit the idea in the clean price. So the accrued interest represents here this fraction of the future coupon payment. And for us as a mathematician, it may be a bit useless to do this decomposition, but if you now draw, for example, a small picture, you see what is happening. If this here is, for example, our tenor discretization, T1, T2, T3, and so on, yeah, say this here is our Tn. So then this, this means that in the end, I receive the whole amount plus the coupon. Okay, in between, I always receive the coupon. So if you now look, what is the value of 
this zero copper bond. Well, this here is one, okay. So at the end, very shortly before this last payment, the value of this last payment would be, okay, exactly this here. And then if you go to an earlier point in time, the values may be decreasing, yeah, because in the valuation, yeah, you now multiply with the zero copper bond values, you wait longer, maybe the value is decreasing. But then there is this payment here. So if this payment is now inside the sum, then the dirty price would be larger. So if you now just observe everything that is in the future, you have a somehow somehow you have a zigzag curve, which looks maybe a little bit like that. Because if you buy a zero copper bond in between, yeah, so say for example, you buy the zero copper bond at this time here, you do not receive the coupons from the past. No? You always receive the coupons in the future. So you will receive these three coupons. When you have moved now across this line, this coupon has dropped out of the value that you observe on the market. So this here is the market observed value of this guy. Okay, and I made the same mistake as earlier. Yeah, So there is no coupon in the first period, but in the first period, maybe the coupons are somewhat chosen such that the value is equal to, equal to one. Yeah. So, and then the value maybe decreases here further. So what is the clean price now doing? Okay, so this guy here is the dirty price. The green one is my dirty price. The dirty price I observe on the market. And the clean price is just subtracting this diagonal line here. Okay, so it's subtracting the, the, the fractional amount of the coupon. Huh? So if I subtract this, actually I get something that is not jumping. Okay, so you are just removing these coupon values. Yeah, you only do this on the payment days. So then before there's nothing, there's no, there's no difference. It looks a little bit as if we are making this guy to a martingale, but this is not true. Yeah? So what you have to make it to a martingale, so this is maybe now an important remark here. Yeah? If the coupon falls out of the evaluation when crossing the payment date, yeah? so then neither the dirty price, this guy that jumps, nor the clean price, they would be QN martingales. To construct such a martingale, what you would have to do is you would have to add the coupon and reinvest it, for example, in the rolling bond. So instead of dropping down here, yeah, what you do is instead of paying this coupon, you reinvest it into your portfolio. No, your portfolio is self-financing, so nothing is taken out, nothing is added. The coupon has to be added to the portfolio such that the value process would just continue here. Okay, the value process would just continue such that if you now divide this guy here with the numerator, you have a martingale. Yeah? So this guy here divided by the numerator is a martingale. These things we have discussed here are just prices you observe on the market where values have been taken out once they have been paid. Okay, so that's also just for completeness that you know some market conventions, yeah, like Descartes conventions, dirty price, clean price, for the mathematical theory for the evaluation, it's not important. We will always value dirty prices in the sense that we consider all future payments. So I have introduced one additional product, the coupon bond. And it's trivial, it's just a constant payment at the future point in time. Now let's turn to an interesting other guy. Let's pay something that is stochastic. So this is now 
my floater and it pays at the future point in time, say ti plus one. So if you like, you have now again here different periods. So t1, t2, t3, and so on. Yeah. So maybe you have here some tn. And now I pay something that is stochastic. I pay my forward rate. So this wiggling is because it is stochastic here. Sometimes it is higher. Yeah, and whatever I pay my forward rate for this period here. Yeah, so this is my period length. I pay L multiplied with the period length, and I pay it at the end of the period. So that's also important. I pay it here in T2. Yeah? So this here is the time when I fix it. Yeah, so it is fixed at the beginning of the period. It is known for the whole period. I pay it at the end. And small remark, if we would pay a backward rate, the value would be the same as long as we are here before the periods. Okay, so what is the value of this at some earlier point in time? What is the value of this at some earlier point of time in time little t? It just looks complicated because the thing that I pay here is stochastic. Yeah? It's not known. Yeah? It is fixed in ti. So I cannot expect that this is just this value here multiplied with the zero Cooper bond that pays in ti plus one observed in little t. That would not be f little t measurable because this object is not f little t measurable. So I do not know the value. Surprise, the value of the floater is exactly this. Yeah? It is the coupon which I pay my L multiplied with the period length multiplied with the zero Cooper bond corresponding to the payment time observed in little t. So the valuation formula is exactly the same as for the fixed copper bond. Well, with a little with a little detail, it is the forward rate observed in little t. Yeah. So this guy is f little t measurable. This is not obvious that this holds. Yeah, If you have two random variables, um, it's not the case that the expectation of the product of two random variables is the product of the two expectations. There, there could be correlation. Yeah? And of course, this is also not the way this works here. If we are in the special situation that we have a single interest rate curve, and my, my chapter is stay still single curve, this means that there is a relation between the forward rate and the zero copper bond. So the P that appears in the definition of the L is the same P that appears here. In a general theory, this does not need to be the case, but if we just have one curve of zero copper bonds, P, then this holds. Then I can plug in the definition of the L. So recall the definition of the L. So this is one divided by the period length, bond at the beginning minus bond at the end, divided by the bond at the end. So if you plug this in, you see that this guy here, the bond at the end cancels this period length cancels. And you see all you have is this part here, bond at the beginning of the period minus bond at the end of the period summed over all periods. This is a, this is a telescope sum. Okay, so in this case, this 
72 is a telescope sum. And you just have that this is the bond at the beginning of all periods. So this is just the PT1 minus the bond at the end of all periods minus the PTN. Multiplied with M divided by one unit of currencies if we pay M times this interest rate at uh, times the period length at the end of the period. Okay, so we have a very nice formula. And in the case that we have just a single curve where this falls down to a telescope sum, it is very simple, just a bond at the beginning minus the bond at the end. Also, you see, it doesn't even care about the time discretization. Yeah? Like for our backward looking rate, yeah, we have this special situation. It appears a little bit as if these interest rates are just the right quantities to neutralize waiting for this payment. So why is this the case? I have two versions of the proof. And the reason that I have two versions is also because we learn something from that. The second version is just based on taking the universal valuation theorem, going to a martingale measure, taking expectation. But maybe this is hiding a little bit of stuff. The first version is on what I will later comment on called static replication. So first one. So it is enough to just look at a single payment. Yeah. So I did not stress this, but the floater pays this here for all I. So for all periods. And it is enough just to look at the value of a single period, because if I have the sum of all guys, I get the sum, of course, here. So it's enough to look at the single payment. I pay M times the forward rate times the period length. By definition, this is the bond at the beginning minus the bond at the end, divided by the bond at the end. Everything is observed in time Ti. So Everything is here fixed. These are the zero copper bond values observed at the beginning of the period. So this is paid in Ti plus one. Okay, so you have here Ti plus one, where I pay this. But if this is fixed in Ti, then this random variable is FTI measurable. So if I'm past this point here, then this is for me like a constant. So it is only random if I'm before or on TI. Yeah? So on TI, it is becoming deterministic, it's becoming known. It's only random if I'm before TI. So actually, along this period here, it is like paying a constant amount. So I know the value of this payment here, but I also know the value of this payment here, because at an earlier point of time, it is just this amount times the value of a zero Cooper bond. So as seen in TI, the value of this payment is just a multiple of the zero copper bond that is fixed in TI, but pays in TI plus one. Okay, so this is my, my, my payment time. So I just multiply this stuff here on the top. I just multiply this, this part with a zero copper bond that pays in TI plus one and is observed in TI. This is the value in TI, yeah? while on top it was the value in TI plus one. So you could think of buying this divided by one currency units 
of this zero copper bond at this point, because then at the end, you just have this amount times one. So this is what you have to do at this point in time to have the right amount here. So, but now if you look at the right hand side, you see that this is just a portfolio of two zero copper bonds. Yeah? This is just a zero copper bond that pays in TI and a zero copper bond that pays in TI plus one. This one here in a long position, this one here in a short position. Yeah. So buy one of these, sell one of these. How many units of this? M divided by one currency units of this. So you just know what you have to do at a point that is even earlier in time. So at a point that is even earlier in time, say at point little t, you just buy this portfolio of two zero copper bonds at time little t, which gives me the value of this floater in time little t. So actually I have told you the strategy to actually replicate the value yeah, by this portfolio here. And now you can plug in the definition of the L at a point little t, you can plug this in back and see that this is exactly L times P of Ti plus one, yeah? like in the theorem. So this way of the proof yeah, works actually without really knowing how these stochastic processes behave, equivalent martingale measure, all this stuff is not needed. Second version of the proof, and then we maybe can conclude this session. Let's go brutal along the line of the universal valuation theorem. I choose a numeraire. Maybe I choose a special one. I choose the one that corresponds to the payment time. Yeah? So that was here my payment time, the Ti plus one. The zero copper bond that matures in Ti plus one is chosen as my numeraire. The value of the floater is the payment of my floater divided by my numeraire. Take the conditional expectation, yeah, conditional to valuation time of this ratio, multiply with the numeraire at valuation time. Okay, so if this is my numeraire, my numeraire at payment time is just equal to one. So this is now floater divided by one unit of currency. Actually, it's exactly the fraction we had before. And now you plug in the definition of the payment, of the payoff. The payoff is my L. So L was bond at the beginning of the period minus bond at the end of the period divided by the bond at the end of the period, divided by the period length, multiplied with the period length, that cancels out. Okay, this is paid. Okay, then you observe that this guy here is again my numeraire. Okay, and you see this is just, take the value of these two zero core bonds. These are martingales. So from the martingale property, yeah, these are just traded assets divided by the numeraire, we get that this is just the value of these two zero copper bonds divided by the numeraire, multiplied with the numeraire. Okay, the numeraire cancels and we have the same result. Yeah, this is just the difference of the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period. Okay, so you see, the two are similar, yeah? But here I just say, okay, it's a martingale. And here I just say, okay, I can buy this portfolio. Hence, this has to be the value at the earlier point in time. Yeah, this martingale property, yeah, can be a little bit generalized, yeah? This also works in other situations. This then uh, leads to the point that this works for all linear products and maybe we continue here next time.
Well, that was it for today. Thanks.